The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. Before I call the Honourable Member for Don Valley to open the debate, I wish to make a short statement about a subjudice resolution. I'm sure members will have relevant constituency cases that they might want to raise in today's debate, but just needed to remind you that under the terms of the House's subjudice resolutions, members should not refer to any cases where there are ongoing legal proceedings and should also exercise caution if raising matters that are not the subject of active legal proceedings, but where discussion could prejudice ongoing police or other law enforcement investigations. Order, order. Nick Fletcher to move the motion. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. I beg to move that this House considers e-petitions 624876 and 643611 relating to legislating, legislation in respect of dangerous dogs. Jack was 10. His mum, Emma, described him as our perfect boy. But on November the 8th, 2021, Jack went to call on a friend. He was attacked and killed by an XL bully. Jack suffered fatal injuries. Ten years old, his life over, absolutely tragic. Jack's mum, Emma, has told me that their lives will never be the same again. The community came together and showed huge support for Emma and her family. But sadly, Jack is gone forever. Now, I've had to lead petition debates on many subjects, often in circumstances when a life has been sadly lost. But I do not believe I have ever had to speak where there has been a loss of life in such horrific circumstances. We have two petitions before us to debate. The first petition calls for Dangerous Dogs Act to be repealed, and the second for the Act not to include the XL bully. Having heard Emma's story and taken evidence before today, having seen and heard many of these attacks, I can understand why the government have announced this ban. However, before I move on to the arguments of this debate, I want to make it clear that Emma never called for this ban as she believed it would never happen. Shockingly, Emma has received real abuse since the announcement of this ban from people who disagree with it. I think to do that to a grieving mother is abhorrent and I would hope that those responsible if caught are dealt with severely. Emma has suffered enough. Her only goal is to make sure no one else has to go through such an ordeal. My heart goes out to her. I now turn to the government's um, petitioner's position. The government, following a concerning rise in attacks and fatalities caused by XL bully dogs, has added this breed to the list of dogs banned under the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991. To help current owners adapt to the new laws, these changes will come into force in two stages. From the 31st of December 2023, it will be against the law to sell an XL bully dog, abandon an XL bully dog or let it stray, give away an XL bully dog, breed from an XL bully dog, have an XL bully in public without a lead and muzzle. From the 1st of February 2024, it will be a criminal offence to own an XL bully dog in England and Wales unless your dog has a certificate of exemption. There is help on getting an exemption certificate on the government website. But if you want to keep your dog, it must be microchipped kept on a lead and muzzled at all times when in public, kept in a secure place so it cannot escape, and neutered. As the owner, you must also be over 16 years old, take out third-party public liability insurance against your dog injuring other people, be able to show the certificate of exemption when asked by a police officer or a council dog warden, either at the time or within five days. Will the I will. 
very grateful to him. He's making very good points about the, what the government has laid out on his website. But one of my concerns is with the ban coming in so quickly is does he believe the public have no enough information or where to find this information to make that informed decision for conscientious owners who want to look after these dogs and protect them? Do you think he, is there enough time to make sure that that information has got out of what is needed from responsible owners? Thank my honourable member for his contribution, Danny. He is right, and I will actually come on to that later on within my speech, but I thank him for his contribution. Now to the petitioners. I have discussed these petitions with many friends and colleagues like me after hearing of such horrific attacks. They and I found it hard to believe the numbers that support the repealing of this ban. We have banned other dogs in the past. These dogs are obviously dangerous, so who would not want to ban them? So what's the reason? And let's explore this further. As part of the research I carried out, I have spoken with many professionals in this field. I have personally attended six evidence sessions and attended the DEFRA committee evidence session back in October. So what has been said? Anita Mehdi, the main petitioner creator, stated she believes that adding another breed to the Dangerous Dog Act isn't the right way forward. She also believes the media is to blame for fear-mongering and there isn't any official data with dog breeds and dog attacks. Anita hopes for a platform where accurate data can be recorded. Anita also believes that it is dangerous to class a dog by its type when it is irresponsible owners that need to be targeted. She believes the Calgary model is a good example that the government should take into consideration when looking into responsible ownership. When asked about muzzles, Anita explained that responsible owners would comply and use them, but it's owners, well, it's some owners that would need to be tackled who won't. Glyn Saville, who is here today, petitioner against the XL bully ban, said the numbers of XL bullies is in excess of 90,000, and therefore dealing with the ban is going to be very difficult. He also mentioned that these dogs are not bred to be aggressive to humans. Some may disagree. He stated that if a ban is brought into effect, then families living in social housing have a real risk of losing their pets if they wish to stay there, as landlords can refuse exempted dogs. Another petitioner who has called for muscles not to be part of the ban said her dog cannot now defend itself and has been attacked by other dogs since having to wear it. Even the professionals have their concerns. The British Veterinary Association stated that banning one breed will not work. The lady from that association compared it to the banning of a singular weapon and explained that it may work for a short term, but the ultimate goal is surrounded by so many complex social issues that it will be difficult to last long term. I will indeed. I, I thank him for giving way because <coughs> earlier in this contribution he made reference to Emma. Emma is, of course, my constituent. And uh, Jack, her son, was brutally killed by an XL bully dog two years ago. Emma is of the opinion that whatever happens with regard to a, a ban on XL bullies and their enormous difficulties and complications regarding that, which he's touched upon, it is absolutely vital that we do place an emphasis on tackling the whole issue of dangerous dogs. And a one-off action by the government is not enough. It can never be enough. What we need is a thoroughgoing wholesale examination of, of all issues like dog breeding, dog training. You know, we, we need to be looking at the issue of responsible ownership. All of these issues have to be considered so that we are truly safe as a society. Thank the Honourable Member for his contribution. Once again, I will be coming on to many points that he's raised, and the Minister's here as well, so hopefully the Minister can shed some light on that too. The BVA also said, um, when I spoke to them, that uh, the in the London Vet Show, my Honourable Friend from Penrith and the Borders raised the fact that most fatalities have been in people's houses rather than when a dog um, is being out. And obviously in the house, they're not muzzled or on a short lead either. They've also asked that the Dangerous Dog Act to be reviewed and highlighted that Section 3 of the Act gives scope for something to be done about controlling dogs. 
I often say in this place, it's not always new legislation that is needed, but rather it is enforcement of existing legislation that is required. That is something that also needs to be looked at. The RSPCA explained that they want government to slow down the pace of the ban coming into force, mainly because of its implications and consequences, as was mentioned earlier. They've also raised it as becoming incredible, diff incredibly difficult to ensure everyone who owns an XO bully, bully can do what they need to do before the deadline if they want to keep their dog. They mentioned they are seeing abandonment and relinquishment for these types of dogs due to unexpected costs before Christmas. The BVA also highlighted that the window for neutering should be extended for another six months for dogs that are currently under seven months old as neutering has an impact on their growth. The RSPCA suggested that there should be a campaign into responsible dog ownership but stakeholders should be brought together to see what dog legislation may look like in the next five years. In addition to my research, the Mirror is also supporting the proposed Jack Lee's Law, which is calling for a different approach to dog legislation that will include all dogs and focus on breeding, training and the sale of dogs. There is much interest in this topic, and rightly so. To conclude, Chair, I do not think that anyone who signed these petitions should be vilified. Many understand something needs to be done. But when experts agree that there are issues, the government should listen. We have to stop these incidents occurring, that is for sure. But if we are to ban the XL bully, the timeline for neutering definitely needs looking at. And we must really push for responsible ownership. I will get back. Member for giving way. I'm genuinely conflicted on this. I was on the EFRA Select Committee when we did a previous inquiry into the Dangerous Dogs Act. I think it was rushed through and not fit for purpose, but at the same time, my heart absolutely goes out to any family that's been affected by, you know, the, a, a bully, an XL bully dog has, has killed um, particularly a child. On the question of responsible dog ownership, though, my concern is when you talk about training courses or anything like that, it will be the already responsible owners that take that up. And it's very difficult to spot an irresponsible owner until the dog has caused harm. And I just wondered whether the committee had looked at that. The committee, the petitions committee, no, has not looked at that. I believe DEFRA have looked at it, and I just come on to that in my next part of my speech, actually. DEFRA has had a responsible dog ownership steering group that published a report and confirmed that the recommendations will be shared later this year. So I ask if the minister com can confirm when this will be shared. The Calgary model has been mentioned many times in my research, so we have something we can copy and improve if required. We are an animal-loving country, but we must encourage... Of course I will, yes. Thank you very much for um, In light of the concerning incidents involving dogs' uh, attacks, particularly those attributed to XL Bully, does he agree with me that the government should shed light on its plans to implement DNA sampling and adopt the Calgary model for dogs' classification in order to ensure accurate identification and classification of these dogs? Thank you for the member's contribution. Yeah, the Calgary model is definitely something that I believe that we should really be looking at. With regards to the type and breed, I know it is an area of contention and there's some work needs doing on that. But I do genuinely believe people know what type of dog that they've got. They know that they've got an XL bully or not. So I think we need to be really careful not to use that um, as a way of, um, of not muzzling dogs that could cause harm. And that is the last thing that we want. Um, we are an animal loving country but we must encourage personal responsibility when making the decision to own a pet we must choose a dog that fits our home our family and our lifestyle dog owners must ensure they understand the costs involved and that they train the dogs correctly and themselves for that matter some say that we need to enforce chipping of dogs and have a database that accurately records all pets and any bites that have occurred, no matter how minor. We must also look at breeders to see what can be done here too. There are many good breeders, but not all are. We must never again have to hear of another story like Emma's. And in memory of little Jack, we should work collectively to come up with the right answers for both our safety as the public and that of our pets, and we must do it quickly. Thank you. Thank 
you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 624876 and 643611 relating to legislation in respect of dangerous dogs. I call Ian Lavery. Thank you, uh, dear Caroline and Pazava. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, chairpersonship, I should say. This is a... This is an extremely emotive issue, you know, it really, really is, and I hope people understand different people's views on this, because it, 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 is, it is extremely emotive, and listening to the Honourable Member for, for Don Valley and, and my Honourable Friend um, regarding uh, 10-year-old Jack, it's enough to make anybody despair, really. It's, it's very, very, very sad, and it... In my constituency, I think when we looked at the um, when we looked at the, the petitions, my constituency had the most individuals who would sign the petition. Two, nearly three thousand, and the constituency next to me, uh, Blythe Valley, had the second highest um, signatories to the petition. So you can see how. Uh, how views are very much split on all of this, you know. But you know, the it's a fact that more people, and it seems to be mainly young people, have been injured because of these incidents. I think if we look at the the police figures, I think eleven thousand three hundred and seventy-three uh, incidents between July twenty uh, two thousand and twenty-two and June two thousand and twenty-three, and over the same period. Uh, last day uh, this year, it's 13,940. So it cannot continue. It really cannot. This is, this is absolutely desperate stuff. Little Caden Byrne in, in my constituency was, was mauled only a few weeks ago when he was playing in the street by a dog. Not muzzled. Wasn't on a lead. And it was running, ramping through the street. But the thing is, the dog had done it before. And the police were aware of it. And nothing happened. Dame Caroline. Nothing had happened. And here we had this wonderful young lad uh, mauled for playing in his own street. So as I say, it's very emotive. And as a dog lover, I understand people being concerned about possibly losing a, a much loved one, a well-behaved pet because of a government regulation that bans all dogs with a certain look as being dangerous. And there's got to be a recognition that each individual dog has its own temperament, has its own personality, has its own character. And I agree with a number of the comments made by the Honourable Gentleman uh, and that the, and the RSPCA and other organisations that ban dogs merely based on, on what they look like what they look like isn't the best approach. And the latest, the latest uh, to be treated in this manner, of course, is why we're here today, is that of the American Bully X. And I appreciate the anxiety, the responsible owners of these dogs, and dogs that may simply look like this breed, are now facing. We must all recognise, however, that, that there is a problem, as I've mentioned, with dangerous dogs per se, and that's resulted in, in, in many deaths and serious injuries. Far too many. Uh, and it's increasing and increasing. We, the owners have not always had the training and the knowledge required for owning certain types of dogs. And we also got this horrendous uh, increase in unscrupulous backyard breeders, particularly of dogs of this nature. And that's one of the core problems. There's many problems, but that's one of the core problems. Some people think they can make a few bob out of selling these dogs, and they're not, they haven't got a clue what they're doing, and it's causing absolute mayhem. So we, we, we've, got to, we've got to realise that, and I think some of the legislation the, the, um, that's been put in place or suggested uh, tackles that to a certain Degree. The law as it stands in the form of the Dangerous Dog Act 1991 is inflexible. And it's crude and fails to address the, the complex issues which many people have mentioned. And as a consequence, <coughs> fails in a stated aim of protecting people from dog attacks. 
a fresh approach and a more sophisticated legislature is absolutely needed with regard, with regard to dangerous dogs. It's not just the XL bully. It's dangerous dogs, and that should be recognised. You know, when we discuss the XL bullies, what is an XL bully? What is it? Because it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crossbreed. It's a crossbreed. And you cannot just say, well, that dog looks like an XL bully, and I'll measure, measure 50 inches or whatever it may be, so you qualify to be euthanized. <coughs> you know, that's, it's not the right approach, man. It really isn't. And a lot of these XL bullies are absolutely wonderful dogs. Wonderful dogs. And I bet most people in here have got a pet of their own. And they wouldn't want somebody coming knocking on the door saying, that looks like a certain breed. So unfortunately, my friend, we're going to have to take this dog away. If you haven't got the, the, the papers that's required under the uh, amendments to the Dangerous Dog Act 1991, and we're going to have to put it down. It's not the right approach, you know. It really isn't the right approach. Understanding that the families that suffered so greatly because of dangerous dogs. But it, in the, the, the memo and in the information that's been sent out, it, it says if the dog meets certain characteristics, it might be considered as an XL bully. What does that mean? That means it, it's not if you've got an XL bully. It's if you might have an exhale bully, or if your breed might just be an exhale bully. I think the Honourable Gentleman made a, a really fair point before there, where there needs to be like a bit of a definition. However, I, I understand that if, if you check the DNA of any particular dog, it'll come back like from a million years ago, and it'll have all these different uh, characteristics of, of different breeds. But I mean, if you look at a Dalmatian, you're not a Dalmatian because you've got black spots and a white coat. However, it's not the same for XL bullies. And I think we need really to, to have a, a, a look at the... the of course I will. You make such a powerful point. Where have you been struck by how constructive the correspondence has been on this issue from both sides, given how emotive it is, as he said, and there's a mum thinking about children that have been mauled. It's absolutely devastating. But a constituent wrote to me and said, although I do not own an XL bully, family members and close friends own Staffordshire Terriers, Labrador Crosses, and other bully crosses, which have been proved by DNA not to be an XL bully, although under the current guidelines would incorrectly see them to be classified as an XL bully. And this is sending shivers up the spines of many, many pet owners and I do think it is incumbent on us to think this through very, very carefully. I think the Honourable Lady makes an absolutely uh, positive, correct point, very accurate. My family dog, it's not mine, it's my son's, Olive, is a beautiful young puppy. It's a, it's a, a sharp ear, but I, I'm pleased that she's, she's got the shorter legs. Because if she'd had longer legs, I'm telling you, somebody would be saying, that's a dangerous dog. And it's one of the most wonderful uh, animals you could ever, 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 ever want. So uh, you, you make a very valid point. Staffies, for example, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, they're fantastic animals. Anybody with any expertise in the dog world knows about Staffordshire Bull Terrier. You get the odd bad one in any breed, by the way. You get the odd bad dog name on. You get bad Labradors. You get bad retrievers. Yeah, but <coughs> what, what's being said is that we need to look at dangerous dogs, not just exhale, exhale bullies. So I would, I'm wondering, Dame Curran, who's going to like police this? Who's going to be knocking on the doors with a tape measure? Is the families looking, uh, and a lot of families, which again has been mentioned, or, or, or concerned that the dogs might be classified because they look like something and they might be losing them. A, lo a, you know, a loving pet. It's not right. And I urge the minister, two main points. We've got to ensure that people do follow the government uh, legislation. We've got to follow what's being put out there. It's absolutely essential that they do that. And the government have got to pause and review this, this entire legislation and come forward with uh, amendments to the Dangerous Dog Act 
uh, and not just uh, focus solely on one potential breed that consider might look like something which it might not be. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And at the same time, please don't think that I don't want any legislation. I want to ensure that there isn't any single person mauled again by any dogs anywhere in this country. And whatever we can do to uh, do that properly, properly, man, then I would support. Another few uh, real points are the fears of dumping. The fears of dumping um, the, uh, before the, the 31st of December deadline. That's huge issues whether people, because they cannot afford it, um, they don't understand the re legislation, will dump these dogs. And then you've got the issue with if they're put into a, 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 a centre, you know, like a you know, like one of the uh, animal uh, rescue centres, then if the dogs after the 31st of December are in a rescue centre, they cannot be removed, so the rescue centres could be inundated with dogs. Then you've got what is a massive issue, is the issue with the veterinary surgeons, because if I was a vet, I wouldn't be putting a healthy dog down. I, would, I, I think it's important that we put dangerous dogs to sleep. But I wouldn't be putting healthy dogs down because the government said so. And I think that's really important. 94%. My Honourable Friend is making a number and making a number of very, very good points indeed. But does he share my concern that when the government introduces a, a ban on XL bullies, many of the illegal breeders, quite unscrupulous individuals who he's referred to, if action is not taken against them, they will simply move on and create another kind of dog. Because as he says, the XL bully is not a distinct breed. It is an amalgamation of other breeds, if you like. And the same thing might happen with another kind of dog if action is not taken against those illegal breeders. Well, absolutely, and that's so true. And, you know, the, one of the final points I would make is the unscrupulous owners. And the, the breeders, I mean, the breeders are, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, they're breeding these dogs, they're crossbreeding with different types of... And, and, and what for? A lot of these owners, you know, uh, love the fact that they can walk around with the XL bully and say, look at me, I'm, I'm big and I'm tough and I've got this dog <coughs> and if you, you know, I'll, I'll set it on you if you... Um, but the vast majority are responsible owners. And they love their dogs. So that's the, that's the, the huge, huge issue with regard to, the, um, with regard to the, this issue we're discussing today. And, and my final point, uh, and, and basically this will be focused at the minister. You know, the only thing in the, the legislation, or sorry, in the, like the, the letter of 31st of October, I think, uh, that mentions that uh, if you want to put your dog down, we'll charge you two, we'll give you £200 to do so. What about these people who are struggling, who have got a dog, they're looking after them very well, uh, they might not be able to afford the insurance, they, they might not be able to afford the, uh, the licence, they might, that's £92. What about the government considering some sort of financial support to you know, regulate and regularise good, honest owners and good, honest breeders? Thanks. Dr. Trace Coffey. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to, to speak in this debate under your chairmanship. And I thought as the Secretary of State who introduced this legislation, in fact it was my last act in government, I thought it appropriate to contribute to today's debate. The debate surrounding the ban on XL bully dogs on, on the 1991 Dangerous Dogs Act is itself a complex issue that evokes strong emotions. I do understand this very much and it's been a carefully considered amount, um, uh, approach that was taken. I'm also conscious, um, given your ruling earlier, but I'm also aware that there are potential legal challenges against the government, so I need to be measured and not reveal all of the information that we considered during this time. Um, I've had three rescue dogs, uh, and my mother and sister have another rescue dog at the moment, and there's no doubt an adorable pet. It brings a lot to people's lives, to their hearts. And I'm also very conscious of the challenges that those people who've suffered from dog attacks, um, whether it be their children themselves or indeed their own pets, uh, are obviously can be very distressed by that. But the reality was, and there was no knee-jerk reaction, 
is that there were simply too many attacks happening and the proportion of attacks happening by XL bully type dogs was considerably higher than others. And yes, I'm sure we've all read about how, whether it's a Collie or a Jack Russell or potentially a Rottweiler, has also been involved in many attacks. It's the proportion, it's the seriousness of the attacks and indeed how they can be stopped is pretty difficult to do. Um, but also, of course, the fatalities as well. Now, the Honourable Member for Wandsbeck talked about how you define a breed and some other pointers. This breed is not defined. In fact, um, it's, I pay tribute to the Chief Veterinary Officer and indeed many officials who've been involved extensively in this sensitive matter, but also working with experts, whether that be from the police, uh, animal welfare ex experts, and indeed uh, local councils who will have to undertake a lot of that. But I think it... Um, I want to ass uh, assure the House that a lot of care has been taken in this approach, um, but that is also why a lot of this is guidance and there will be individual decisions. Now, coming back to the fact that, of course, many of these uh, dogs are pets. They're not necessarily status symbols, but we know that they have been used for that. You can see a lot of that often by the fact that ears have been cropped on these dogs, turning them into more aggressive feel and appearance to try and reinforce that, despite the fact that under the 2006 Animal Welfare Fact, uh, Act, I suggest that is already illegal to do. It's not illegal to import those dogs, but we are talking about an extensive element uh, there where that is the case. And well, well. let me just finish my sentence. What I will say is that along the way since the 1991 Dangerous Dogs Act, there have been some amendments, partly uh, driven through case law, back in 97 and further regulations in 2015, but it, it, there was a specific reason. I, th I would suggest to you the extent of the attacks is the reason why it's been the first breed to have been added uh, to a Schedule 1, uh, Section 1, since 1991. Uh, I, I'm strict as my right honourable giving way, and uh, she is an esteemed legislator of, of great repute. Uh, and does she agree, therefore, that we can't in this Parliament legislate with imprecision? And that is exactly what this statutory instrument does. It talks about characteristics, and then it says those may be characteristics that are necessary for the definition, but they may not be. And surely we need to make the law clear beyond peradventure so that the pe people of this country know whether, which side of the law they're on. Well, I would say to the right honourable gentleman, is the guidance is as clear as it can be. It gives a number of physical characteristics, and I'm sure that the minister will say more about this and about the process that's been gone through. But I suppose in introducing the legislation, I wanted to put across very much the case that this is not being considered lightly and a lot of care and attention has been given to the detail. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, emotions, uh, I must admit I've had several death threats about this particular uh, legislation that's been brought into place uh, and I'm conscious that it is driving those strong emotions. But what I will say is that the government took an approach that would allow time for people to rehome if they feel they could not keep an XL bully type dog, but also very dis different to what's happened more recently when people uh, have a pit bull and similar, where they can still apply uh, to get a certificate of, to join the index of exempt dogs. The default here is that every person who registers their XL bully type dog will get a certificate automatically and they will automatically join the index. So that's well. quite a significant difference, even though I'm conscious it will cost some money to do that. Well yeah. that point. I'm grateful for the former Secretary of State and the point she's making to be considered because from the 31st of December, it does say breeding, selling, advertising, gifting, abandoning. But one of the things is rehoming, and there was a Sky report over the weekend that there was said that there was 246 of these dogs currently waiting to be rehomed. I had a constituent stop me on the high street who wants to rehome one, uh, one of these dogs, but is struggling to get the information on how to go about doing that. I'm slightly concerned that that rehoming is one way of saving these dogs, making sure they get that support, by a responsible owner who will take on a license. Is that something that could be considered going forward to say there's a carve out for rehoming to push it back to the 1st of February in line with the rest of the exemptions coming in? Well, clearly I'm not in government anymore, <laughs> so that's a question for the minister. Um, I think it was done in order to bring, if you like, to an end the opportunity for uh, this transfer of dogs and similar. I think there has been, it's admittedly on a rapid timescale, but we must remember the reason why we're taking this approach at all. It is to try and stop attacks. And people read about these every week. They're happening around the country. 
and just rehoming to somebody, they may not, if you like, have the qualities. They might want to absolutely uh, uh, help a dog, but you need a certain amount of training to really look after such a strong animal. If we think about an adult XL bully dog, we're talking about something about 70 kilos. These are big dogs. These really have a lot of strength. And frankly, the only way to unlock their jaws once they latch onto somebody is to basically choke it. Not kick it in the head or anything like that. That will make it grab on even tighter. And that is what we are dealing with, where sadly some of these dogs do get out of control. And it's the characteristics that lead them to have that physical strength. And also we must not get away from the fact that they are originally parts of various bits of pit bulls, mastiffs and similar. So it is understandable why, of course, people who have their ex or bully next to their children every night, probably licking them to death in a different way, if that makes sense of uh, that sort of phrase, uh, and will protect them. But there is that risk, and that risk has become more of a practice that's happened too often. Um, Madam Chairman, I'm not planning to um, uh, linger on this debate. Uh, just briefly on some of the why this is an effective piece of legislation. I'm very conscious of the reviews that have been gone on and how um, different select committees have called for more extensive. I'm also very aware of how the Dogs Trust, RSPCA and similars do not think it's effective. The reality is, though, is that the number of attacks by pit bulls has basically gone away when this legislation was put into place. The muzzling, the different license approach, and that is something that we need to happen as quickly as possible for the existing XL bully dogs in this country. In terms of alternatives, a lot of talk is about licensing. Well, licensing to own a dog was scrapped a long time ago. Uh, I do not think that councils would welcome having to take on the whole licensing of dogs right across the country. Of course, there has to be enforcement on breeding uh, and different other uh, disreputable practices. And, and in Section 3 of the 1991 Act, there is this wider approach for all dogs. Any dog can be dangerous. Uh, but the, specifically, so far, just now, five dogs have been singled out because of the characteristics that they have. I'm very conscious that politicians, uh, our job is to make law. I appreciate you, um, one of my right honourable friends does not think this is the necessary accurate way, but this is what we do. One day something can be legal, the next day it can be illegal. And we're doing it because we believe it's the right thing to do. I'm conscious so far, and I really hope this doesn't happen, but of course it is open to members to not pray against this statutory instrument because it's important that people get that certainty, can take the positive action that they do. As I say, anybody who has an XL bully right now will be granted the certificate to join the index of exempt dogs, and that will be, in effect, automatic as long as the conditions are complied with and they can stay on that register. So in terms of, uh, I'm very conscious uh, uh, many people want to speak uh, today, but people have got time to rehome. Everybody who loves their XL bully can keep their XL bully, and I commend, I hope, the legislation to the House, which will be is still passing through. Caroline, and it's always an honour to serve under your chairpersonship, and it's a privilege to speak in the debate on e petitions six two four eight seven six and six four three six one one relating to legislation in respect of dangerous dogs, so admirably led by the Honourable Member for Don Valley. And I congratulate my Honourable Friend, the Member for Lancaster and Fleetwood, on her appointment as Chair of the Petitions Committee. There are currently four ban breeds banned under the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991. The Pitbull Terrier, Japanese Toza, Dogo Argentino, Fila Brasilio, However, following a rise in attacks and fatalities, the government has added the XL bully to the list of brown breeds from the 31st of December. Strict conditions will need to be complied with. And from the 1st of February 2024, it will be a criminal offence to own an XL bully in England or Wales without a certificate of exemption. Dogs suspected of being of a prohibited type are assessed against a standard which describes what a particular type should look like. However, the number of characteristics is not defined. Neither is the way in which the assessment should be conducted, which results in many legal breeds and crossbreeds 
fitting the standard regardless of the dog's behavior. I am shocked and saddened by the appalling reports of attacks and deaths that have dominated the news recently. I obviously share the public's concerns and agree that current legislation has not prevented these serious dog attacks. Urgent action is clearly needed, but breed-specific legislation is not the answer. The Dangerous Dogs Act has failed to protect the public since it was introduced, and since then, dog bites incidents have risen. Animal welfare, and particularly dog welfare, is an issue very close to my heart. And during the past five years, I've worked closely with Vanessa Wadden of Hope Rescue in Llanharan. Hope Rescue is a dog rescue center and often takes in dogs which have been seized from illegal breeders. Since the ban was announced on the 15th of September, they have been inundated with calls and messages from worried owners asking for advice, especially those that aren't sure if their dogs meets the standard because it is so wide. Hope Rescue is currently receiving up to five calls a day from all areas of the UK, from owners asking them to take in their XL bully. Hope Rescue is concerned that as the date approaches, that there is a risk some of these dogs will be simply abandoned. As a rescue that holds several stray dog contracts, there is a chance they will simply enter their rescue center as strays. They are already under huge pressure with capacity due to the current animal welfare crisis, resulting from <coughs> the increased number of dogs purchased during the pandemic and the subsequent cost of living crisis. And in fact, they are over capacity as they are having to pay for overflow kenneling to ensure they can meet their stray dog commitments to local authorities. The likely abandonments will put additional pressure on a system that is already broken due to lack of kennel capacity. Hope Rescue has already seen an increase in the number of large bull breeds coming through the stray dog system, again due to the breadth of the standard. The predicted increase in the number of dogs coming through the stray system is likely to impact their ability to help other dogs urgently in need, especially through their work supporting local authorities with dogs seized from illegal and low welfare breeders. This could lead to dogs potentially being left suffering longer in poor conditions as there is nowhere for them to go. Hope Rescue are really proud of the much needed support they provide to licensing teams in Wales. And it's heartbreaking that they may not be able to help in the future. They're also hugely concerned, they are also hugely concerned about the XL bullies currently in their car that they don't yet own. They have been seized from illegal breeders but haven't been signed over through the Section 20 court process. These are young, rehomeable dogs they've worked really hard with to prepare for their new homes. They are worried that the court process won't be completed in time to rehome them before the ban comes in, and they will have no choice but to euthanize them. Hope Rescue is also worried that any XL bully types that come into their care as the 31st of December deadline gets nearer. As a responsible rescue, it takes time to properly, properly assess their dog for rehoming. After this date, they won't be able to rehome them. The well-being of staff is a huge and legitimate concern. They are passionate, caring individuals who have chosen a career in animal welfare because they want to make a positive difference to the lives of rescued dogs. It's already tough for them. 
due to the current animal welfare crisis and the number of dogs coming into their care. Being forced to euthanize healthy, rehomable dogs that may never have put a paw wrong will be devastating for them. Will my honourable friend give way on that point? I'm very grateful to her for giving way and I've listened intently to the debate because like many members I think I feel quite conflicted about it but my interest in this was piqued last summer when three women who were walking their dogs in a park in newton le willows in my constituency were attacked by an XL bully and their dogs were badly injured. They were injured and have been traumatised to it. So I, just, I think it's important to make the point that many of those who are in favour of what the government is proposing are also dog lovers and they and their animals deserve our consideration and protection as well, I think. I thank my honourable friend for his intervention and I really respect the honourable member's view put in a very measured way. Thank you very much. On behalf of Hope Rescue, I urge the UK Government to consider letting rescue centres rehome XL bully types that, through no fault of their own, find themselves in a rescue centre. Subject can I thank the Honourable Member for giving way because uh, she and I visited Hope the Rescue Centre in Clan Harry together a few months ago. And uh, in addition to the many moving things we saw and heard there, one of the things I felt very moved by was the fact that they had a number of deformed dogs which they'd taken from illegal dog breeders. And many of those dogs would have to have been put down. And uh, that brought home to me how illegal breeding is such a menace in our country. Mm -hmm. And it really needs to be clamped down on. Does she agree with me? I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. And um, not many people know this, but we were in school together many years ago in Comfort Comprehensive School. Not that many. <laughs> um, so I always listen to his views, and I do agree. Thank you. So as I was saying, on behalf of Hope Rescue, I urge the government to consider letting rescue centres rehome XL bully types that through no fault of their own find themselves in a rescue centre subject to the exemption process and being assessed for suitable rehoming. A friend of mine, Professor John C Cooper Casey, will be taking the legal challenge to the government if the ban is not halted. John and I served on the Bach Commission between 2016 and 2017, which was chaired by Lord Willie Bach and provided detailed proposals for establishing the right to access justice as a fundamental and enforceable public entitlement. John has always been a staunch advocate for animal welfare, both in and out of court, alongside his relentless representation of people who find themselves in the most vulnerable of situations. His work with dogs includes advising on the reform of the Dangerous Dogs Act, and in particular the flawed breed-specific legislation regime, regime, and advising and drafting proposals for a more effective sentence regime for pet theft. As a former columnist, columnist for Dogs, Today, John has a rescue lurcher called Lawrence. Professor Cooper Casey has stated that this is a knee-jerk this is knee-jerk legislation, which is neither maturely reflected on the wealth of evidence which is available, or taken the time to reasonably consider the best ways to protect the public and act rationally in relation to the dog. It simply won't work. Any proposed ban is no more than putting a sticking plaster over the issue, as unscrupulous breeders will simply move on to the next dog. The answer, according to the government's own previous reports, is an effective licensing regime, responsible ownership, and stricter penalties and sentencing powers in the courts. The law, maturely and carefully considered, can protect the public, this tragically goes nowhere near that. I cannot agree more with Professor Cooper's words. Neither can I disagree with a heartfelt plea from Vanessa Wadden and her wonderful staff at Hope Rescue. 
It is for all these reasons that I call on the government to halt the information of the ban, support responsible rescue centres, review, review the effectiveness of breed-specific legislation and carefully consider how to properly protect the public from serious and fatal dog attacks. Thank you, Dean Carmen. Chairman of the Select Committee, Sir Robert Goodwill. Line. And uh, could I first of all thank the Honourable Member for Don Valley for presenting uh, this debate in a very balanced way. Um, as Chair of the EFRA Committee, this issue has been our, on our radar for some time, and indeed we had a, an evidence session on this particular issue. We were particularly indebted to my honourable friend, the Member for Penrith and the Borders, who is a qualified veterinary surgeon and a member of the committee for the expertise he brought to bear. And it was the unanimous view of the committee that this ban is needed. So why has the government taken action? Well, we, we've already heard uh, of the case of appalling uh, attacks, and the, and the fatal attacks are only the tip of the iceberg. There have been many other reports in the media of, of people being attacked by dogs where the police or, or members of the public have had to intervene. And, of course, there are no statistics at all on dog-on-dog do, on dog on dog attacks, as we heard, uh, which can uh, also happen. Um, the statistics do not make comfortable reading. We, we, there were ro roughly three or so fatal attacks per year until the last two or three years, and it's now gone up to 10 or 11, and more than half of those are down to XL bullies, and of the remainder, many others are down to uh, similar types of breed. Um, I, I got some um, lobbying uh, to try and suggest, well, to say that these dogs are dangerous is like trying to say that red cars are dangerous because there's a lot of red cars about and therefore... But th th that doesn't stack up at all. I mean, the, the, the best estimate we got from one of the big veterinary groups that there's about 50,000 of these dogs in the country. And now, you know, it, using a sort of simple back-of-a-cigarette packet calculation, that would indicate that given the number of fatalities down to these dogs they're maybe two or three hundred times more dangerous uh, than other dogs that are about. Now, adding these dogs uh, to the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991 in Section 1, uh, in, as well as the, three, the pit bulls and three other breeds, I think is a sensible way forward. And as we heard from the former Secretary of State, uh, that was an effective piece of legislation. We're also told by a number of people that these dogs are hard to define. It, it's down to a characteristic rather than a particular breed. It's interesting, though, when we went to Battersea Dogs Home as a committee and there was a litter of puppies, they were described as, these are American XL bully puppies. There was no doubt in their mind what this breed was. And indeed, uh, when I looked uh, this afternoon uh, on a website where dogs are advertised, there was 458 dogs on there described as American XLs. And indeed, in many cases, the actual the, the parents and the grandparents of these dogs were shown in photographs and, and also described as XL bullies. So I can understand why potentially uh, people may try and argue their dogs are not this breed, but uh, it's fairly well understood uh, amongst the veterinary profession and amongst the people trading these dogs what these dogs actually are. It was interesting to note that when I'd looked at this at the time of our inquiry, they were trading anywhere between £800 and £1,500, and now you can pick one up for £200 or indeed free to a good home. And I think the concerns about these dogs being dumped on the roadside uh, are, are really uh, have some um, uh, bearing. Um, looking at some of these advertisements, there were some very interesting descriptions. One said, uh, this dog was fine with kids but does get excited quickly. That, that chilled my heart, actually, to think you know, what might happen. And another said, not fond of other dogs. And that was the person trying to describe this dog in a positive way in an effort to uh, find um, a market. Um, but I think that it is right that we should recognise the concerns of owners of other breeds that may get lumped in the same uh, category as these. In particular, I know I spoke uh, today with the uh, Honourable Member for Rutland and Mel Melton, who has a constituent with an old-time bulldog. Uh, which is the concern that that dog could fall into that particular category. So I think it is important that uh, not only do we uh, make sure these dogs are registered, but people with other breeds can have some sort of reassurance that their breed uh, will not fall into that category, and I hope the Minister will give us some reassurance. So why do people have these dogs? Well, you know, we're told they can be good family pets, but um, uh, my honourable friend uh, from uh, Wandsbeck 
uh, said, you know, if somebody wants to be big and tough, they have one of these dogs. And I've, I've heard it said that, you know, if you carry a knife on the street, then you'll get arrested and the police will search you. But you can walk around with one of these dogs with impunity, and that can be used to intimidate other people. And indeed, uh, I've seen a report in the paper, I won't refer to the spe specific case, where a dog has been used in an attack and a murder charge has been, la uh, has been uh, laid uh, by the police. And indeed, uh, on the Jeremy Vine show, there was a breeder of these dogs who specifically said he bred them to sell to drug dealers, uh, which I thought might have been a bit of bravado, but even so, it does indicate the sort of people, in some cases, who buy these dogs. Uh, my view is quite clear, these are not a suitable family pet. These dogs are a ticking time bomb. Uh, and certainly, um, if my grandchildren, I've got to the age now, were going to play at a friend's house where they had one of these dogs, I would forbid that happening. And I feel very concerned about the safety of people in the home, because we can muzzle these dogs, we can have them under control outside. But in the family home where some of these attacks have happened, I, I feel very concerned that, that children and other people may be at risk. Uh, we heard a reference to, to rehoming. Uh, my understanding is that most of the uh, dog charities are not rehoming these dogs anymore because of the reputation risk. There was a case where one had been re, uh, rehomed and was involved in an incident. So I think um, it's important that I think people do have these dogs and they do comply with the law, that they do themselves need to take sensible precautions. And certainly, uh, if, if, if I was walking a dog and saw one of these dogs coming the other way, I would certainly want to cross the road because many of these attacks are, start off as an attack on a dog, but then when the person tries to save the dog, that turns into an attack on, on an individual. Um, I think I'm particularly concerned about visitors to homes uh, and communication workers, postmen, who, who, who are subject to a number of dog attacks and the, the owners of dogs don't seem to take simple precautions, such as, for example, putting a cage on the back of the door so that when the fingers are inserted to deliver leaflets, as we often do as politicians, uh, that that is not a risk. Or maybe putting a box on the wall outside the property where one of these dogs are. At the moment, um, I know uh, many people um, are getting third-party insurance, because if you join the Dogs Trust, you get automatic third-party insurance. And I think one of the problems I hope the Minister will be looking at is whether it will continue to be possible to get third-party insurance for these dogs if we have further attacks and big claims on insurance policies because the person may be uh, severely injured or worse. Uh, but ultimately, I think this debate is about the value of human life versus the value of canine life. And I think the government has got the balance right. We must protect human life. And if people do feel they can't keep these dogs, they find the restrictions are too onerous. There are lots of dogs in places like Battersea and the Dogs Trust that do need rehoming because the boom in dog ownership that we had during the pandemic is turning into a boom in rehoming. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Dame Caroline. And uh, I came to this uh, debate uh, today uh, in order both to find out more about the issue uh, and also to give a voice to my constituent, Helen, uh, who is caught by what my honourable friend for Christchurch described as the imprecision of the rules about what actually constitutes a uh, dog of this dangerous uh, categorization. Um, I know that uh, the minister uh, is both as kindly, compassionate, and open to reason as any former chief government whip could be. <laughs> and therefore, I presume uh, on the time of the chamber only to quote a few extracts from a quite convincing letter, as I say, from my constituent. Of course, dangerous dogs legislation has a bit of a history. Uh, I was not yet uh, a member of uh, uh, Parliament when uh, the original legislation was passed, but I think I'm correct in recalling that it became a bit of a byword for legislation introduced in a hurry that turned out to be rather more complex than initially seemed to be the case. And I fear that the same may be true of this present update to that act. And so um, it's really with reluctance that I have to say that of course we all agree that the safety of human beings must come first but if we are proposing to inflict severe restrictions on pet owners, then we have at least to be unambiguous in what we do. Let me therefore turn to what Helen wrote to me. And she says as follows, 
I do not have an XL bully. My dog is, by DNA te testing, an American bulldog cross Neapolitan Mastiff mix with multiple <coughs> breeds mixed on the Mastiff side. In other words, I have your basic mutt or Heinz 57 dog. He will be 11 in April, and I've had him since he was nine weeks old. He has never shown an ounce of aggression towards any human, including at the vets during some incredibly negative procedures, none of which the vets have ever felt he needed to be muzzled for, including when he had to have a short pit. Uh, a, a stent placed into his ear uh, when he damaged a blood vessel uh, and he had this procedure done, she says, without pain relief. So, she continues, you can imagine my shock, my horror at learning that the ridiculously vague breed definition of the XL bully, very hastily and incredibly poorly formed by the government, quotes, experts, unquote, somehow seems to have incorporated every and any large, muscular-looking dog in the UK, potentially including my beloved boy, as she describes him. According to the EFRA committee discussion, the XL bully came to the UK in 2014, she says, but uh, her dog was born um, the year before, so she finds it hard to believe that he could so be categorised. But with such a vague descriptor um, as, quotes, gives the impression of great power for size, unquote, and then, quotes, blocky head and neck is medium in length, and the equally vague descriptor that the dog must uh, meet a substantial number of the characteristics, I have no idea if he would fit the type. And seemingly, all that matters is what everybody else thinks. She then goes on to say, well, of course, you could recommend my taking a precautionary approach um, and registering him anyway, because it would just mean that he'd have to be on a lead uh, and be muzzled uh, in order to comply. However, apart from this costing her dog its freedom, which she feels is wholly undeserved, she says there's much more in the way of consequences than you might expect. She says, for example, uh, in relation to health insurance, which she has for the dog, um, that, um, and which she has had ever since she brought him home, uh, she says that this would be lost to her. And um, uh, it would have cost her, for example, without health insurance, over £3,500 for a procedure that her dog had to undergo, but it actually cost her £800 with the insurance. And she says that in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis, she now has to decide whether to register her dog uh, as an XL bully when she doesn't believe that he is one at all. Um, so she says, I don't believe he's an XL bully. It's completely and pointlessly uh, removing his freedom and drastically restricting his life, plus losing the financial backing that I've had for his entire life, um, just at a time when he will need it most. Yet if I don't register him, because I don't believe he is one of this breed, and I wait to see if someone else disagrees, reports me, and then I will wind up having him forcibly seized, taken away at a point when I don't know how much longer he has left with me anyway, and to top it all, I would become a criminal when as a middle class, middle manager who's never been out of work, I've had nothing more than a speeding ticket in my whole life. So really, what she is saying in the individual case is very much in concert with many of the contributions that we have heard so far, which is that this is a blanket approach which is insufficiently focused on the actual 
uh, circumstances under which people should be deprived of their dogs. I do agree we do need legislation. I do agree human life must come first, but I don't agree that this legislation or this statutory instrument as it stands cannot be improved and therefore throwing myself not for the first time on the mercy of this particular minister I look to him to perhaps give us an undertaking when he comes to wind up that the government rather than rushing ahead uh, in, in a, a blinkered way will have another look at the formulation that it's come up with so far to see whether or not people like Helen, who by no stretch of the imagination pose a danger to the public with their beloved pets, uh, cannot be um, excluded from a blunderbuss approach when a rapier is the attitude or is the weapon that we ought to employ in dealing with a very real problem. And uh, it's a privilege to serve under your chairship, uh, Dame Caroline. Um, first of all, I'd like to declare my professional and personal interest in this as a veterinary surgeon and as a fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. Um, we've had a very important debate today, and, we, and it's ongoing. And I fully understand the passion and emotion on both sides of this debate. But can I start by saying that I have sadly come to the conclusion that I believe it is sadly right to go ahead and ban the American XL bully dog. I think it is the right thing to do, and I think the government is doing the right thing in this instance. As we have heard today, we've heard recent accounts, and, and some of us have seen some of these videos of some of these attacks as well, and we do need to act swiftly. This has been a, a difficult decision. The Prime Minister has called for it, and uh, the leader of His Majesty's opposition has supported that. So... The ban is coming, and I firmly believe that we as legislators need to make sure that we get the ban right, um, and I as a veterinary surgeon and MP firmly believe that we can get it right, but the ban is coming, and we need to work together with all the stakeholders to make sure we get this right. This is not a party political issue. How we think about human welfare and animal welfare is something that unites us in humanity across the house. And we need to very much protect people, but also, as we've heard today, we need to protect other animals as well. So I believe that the ban is coming and we need to make it work practically, sensitively, and indeed compassionately. And as we have also heard today, we also, in parallel, need to focus on a longer-term piece of work in terms of perhaps reforming some of the legislation, but also looking very closely at responsible dog ownership. Now, as we've heard, there currently are four types of dogs in the 1991 Act. The Pitbull Terrier, the Japanese Tozer, the Doggo Argentino, and the Phila Brasileira. The American XL Bully, if that then is added to this, um, is, is an important addition in my view. I am aware that many of these dogs are friendly pets in the right homes and the right ownership. But sadly, this type of dog can become because of its sheer size and weight, uniquely dangerous. These are hugely powerful dogs with a hugely powerful muscular jaw structure, as we've heard, weighing up to 50, 60 plus kilograms. We've also seen public statements from consultant human surgeons talking about the severity of the wounds that some of these dogs can cause on, on people, that these bite wounds are worse than some of the bites that you get from other types of dogs, crushing in injuries, tearing industries, um, and, and these have been backed up by sort of statements. So the implications of being bitten or attacked by this type of dog compared to a, a dog such as a French Bulldog or a Jack Russell are just orders of magnitude different. Um, now, as we have also heard, some of these particular types of dogs are bred as well for exaggerated confirmation and extreme confirmational features as well. Some of them have had their ears horrifically cropped. And some of these animals also have been fueled by the uptick in unregulated canine fertility clinics. Now, these are not regulated, they're not supervised by veterinary surgeons, and acts of veterinary surgery take place in these unregulated clinics, blood sampling, artificial insemination. 
And we've looked at this very closely on our EFRA Select Committee, our Pet and Welfare Abuse Inquiry, and we'll be making recommendations about that. So as we have heard today, there are some unscrupulous breeders fueling the trade in some of these dogs. And as we have heard, some of these dogs are used as status symbol type dogs as well. Now, I, 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 I emphasize again, that's not all of these dogs, but it is a significant number of these dogs. Just focusing briefly on the ear cropping. Ear cropping is not clinically indicated at all in the dog. It is a cosmetic procedure that is illegal in this country. And actually, there are loopholes, meaning that these dogs can be imported. Um, and I'm really pleased that the government in this parliamentary session will be bringing forward legislation to ban the importation of ear crop dogs, because that loophole means that, sadly, some of these dogs are being cropped horrifically, illegally, potentially in people's back gardens. And you can go online and get these kits and things like that. And that is horrific. This is a procedure that is not in the benefit for the animal at all. It's to make it look more intimidating. Now, also, popular culture has a role to play in this as well. If you look at some of the really popular animated films, one of my favorite films I watched with my kids was the film Up. And that film, some of the dogs in that were cropped. The film a couple of years ago, Super Pets, one of the lead characters had his ears cropped. So if people are going to the cinema and seeing dogs with their ears cropped, that normalizes it in society. And people think, well, that's normal. And that's what dogs should look like when actually this procedure is horrific and it should be outlawed completely. As we've heard, there is complexity in the typing and the defining of this. Now, the government has engaged closely with police, veterinary and animal welfare experts, and also local authorities to produce guidance and advice. But I stress this is an, an evolving process, an iterative process, and I urge the government and stakeholders to continue to work together to stay round the table so that other types of dogs are not inadvertently caught up in this ban. And I also firmly believe in this debate we need to be very careful in some of the language that we use. Um, we shouldn't be talking about mass culls or killing of animals. I think we need to be very, very careful about some of the language. Very early on, when this debate came to a head in September, the chief veterinary officer, Christine Middlemas, very much spoke of this ban dovetailing with the humane and sensitive managing of the existing population of these XL bully dogs. So I stress, if these dogs are safe and responsibly owned, People can keep them. They can register them so long as they are then neutered, insured, and kept on a lead and muzzled in public. I urge the government and local authorities to work with and support all the animal welfare charities. We've heard the stresses and strains on the animal welfare sector already under significant pressure, and the pandemic really has put them under much more significant pressure. I also urge the government to continue to work closely with the veterinary sector looking at expert opinion, as, as has been articulated by the British Veterinary Association last week in their letter to the Chief Vet, talking about elements like neutering. And so potentially having some flexibility, I think you will get the, the veterinary profession to come along with you. So an extension potentially to the neutering deadlines under which many of the dogs will be neutered under the recommended 18 months of age for a heavy type of dog. So if this was extended for this type of dog, for those animals that were under seven months at the end of January 2024, if you extended that to the end of June 2025, then that would potentially help. And I think that could benefit the health and welfare because there have been studies suggesting that actually if you neuter some of these heavy type dogs too early, then it can lead to an increased risk in developmental orthopedic disease and some other medical conditions. So I, I think that is important to try and work closely with the veterinary profession, and I think that work collectively, that will help. That brings me on to some of the mental health implications of what we are talking about today. For the owners of these animals, for the general public at large, for the veterinary profession and for the animal welfare sector that are taking some of the the hit um, on this. We've looked very closely at some of these issues with our EFRA Select um, Committee inquiry on pet welfare and abuse and also our rural mental health report that we published last year, this year as well. Um, many charities and veterinary professionals will become involved in the euthanasia of those cases that are not able to be kept. 
And I think we need to be very cognizant of that, of, of what that means for the veterinary profession and the paraprofessionals and professionals working there and the, and the animal welfare sectors working with that. I've spoken with many in the sector, and, and as has been mentioned, I was speaking at the London Vet Show a couple of weeks ago, where I heard significant disquiet and distress amongst some vets and practices. So I firmly believe if we, if we take that on board and work collectively with that sector and look um, responsibly and, and see if we can evolve some of it in terms of the neutering guidelines and thinking about some of the capacity issues with regard to, to, to euthanasia, I think that will help us get a more practical and sensible man, ban moving forward. So I, I think if we respond to some of those concerns, um, you'll get more of the vets um, on board. So vets do not like doing things to animals that they do not think is a clinical benefit for those animals. So I think if there's some, some movement, and it's only just six months in the neutering, so we know that from December it will be illegal to breed from these animals. So yes, we want to get the existing dogs neutered so we don't get any more of these dogs coming into being. But actually, I think if we have a little bit of flexibility working with the vets, I think that may well help. Equally so, I must say, I have spoken to some vets who do agree we need to go ahead with this as well. So very much there are views on both sides of the, of the debate. So I think we need to work together to get through this. This is not an easy thing to do. I don't believe this is a politically expedient thing that the government and now the leader of the opposition has backed. I think this is a tough thing to do but I do think it is the right thing to do. Now, I know that some vets and charities will dis disagree with my view, and, and people talk about judging the animal by the deed and not the breed. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Dame Caroline, once that deed is committed, it's too late. That child or adult is maimed or worse. So I, I think we need to, to look at this in the round and think about the deed and or the breed. But I think in the short term, it is the right thing to do to, to add this dog. Yep. He's making a fantastic speech. I'd be great for his uh, expertise on this, whether or not... Currently, there is no legal ramifications for a dog attacking another dog. I just wonder if there's any precedence on introducing that piece of legislation to start collecting data on whether or not that's a predictability and whether he's from his professional opinion, whether a dog attacking another dog is predisposed to attacking further dogs or even humans. I think um, my, my fellow clinical colleague um, in a different profession makes a very, very strong point. Mm -hmm. One of the things we found with our select committee inquiries, there is a paucity, there are a paucity of data on this. And I think um, certainly we've seen an uptick in terms of the attacks on people, but there is a lack of, the, of data in terms of dog on dog attacks. And I, and I think part of this legislation very much is keeping people safe, but it's also keeping other animals safe. So I think the more data we can get to make evidence-based decisions will help moving forwards. As other colleagues have mentioned, we need in parallel to this short-term piece of legislation, we need a longer piece of work. We need to look at responsible breeding, responsible dog ownership, responsible training, responsible socialising of those animals, and also tackle some of the things that have been raised, things like the iniquitous, awful thing of puppy farms and unscrupulous breeders. We need to tackle puppy smuggling as well. And again, I'm grateful to the former Secretary of State who's been driving forward, and the Minister will be doing as well, supporting private members' bills to take elements of the kept animals bill through to tackle some of these things that will ultimately help us improve animal welfare. But these longer-term changes to address the people who are working with these dogs, that's not going to happen overnight. And so that's why I think the government is right to carry on with a short-term ban while this longer piece of work does. We do need to make people better at looking after their dogs, but in the meantime, we need to keep people safe from this particular type of dog. So I fully... Uh, uh, yeah, I will. Yep. He's making a very, very good case indeed. But I think, does he recognise that the danger is that the impression will be given by putting the focus on this one piece of legislation and generally talking in terms of other issues in the future, but, but somehow one statutory instrument would be sufficient to tackle the problem. Isn't there a danger that people will come to believe that, even though we know it not to be the case? I think the Honourable Member makes a, a very interesting point, and, and he also made the point about earlier as well about 
well, once you've banned this type of dog, people will look to find another type of dog. And I do acknowledge that, that some of these unscrupulous breeders will try and develop the next type of status symbol type dog. But that should not stop us in trying to, to stop um, these attacks on people and animals. So I agree it's not perfect, but I think what we have seen in recent times means that something needs to be done now, in addition to a holistic piece of work to address some of the issues that he quite rightly has, has ranged. So I fully recognise that this is very difficult for many owners. It's very difficult for the animal uh, welfare charities and the veterinary sector as well. Th thanks very much for uh, the intervention. As a vet, as a vet is, are, are you not bound by some sort of oath that you, you, vets shouldn't be putting down any animals which are fit and healthy and there isn't any reason whatsoever to put them down. Because what you have said is that you feel that that is necessary. Just wondered what your view personally would be on that. I've raised many points about vets being comfortable with doing some of this and, and actually it's very important that a lot of the veterinary practices and companies have actually surveyed many of their staff and they will not force vets to do things they don't want to do. Um, but that said, I come back to the point that if some of these dogs are safe, they can be kept. So that then if those dogs that are not eligible, that then as we have heard from my, 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 my friend, um, the, the chair of the select committee, it's not feasible for rehoming centres to rehome them and put them into an environment where that dog potentially could hurt someone. So I think sometimes you need to make professional and clinical judgments. And actually, uh, in, in terms of that that some of these dogs sadly will have to, to be put down. But again, I come back to the language that we need to be used. This isn't some form of mass cull, that, that actually we're keeping the dogs that are safe and actually that those dogs that are not deemed safe and can't be registered, then they, we are trying to keep other people and other animals safe. So I recognise the, the difficulties in this on both sides, but I, I do believe that the spate of attacks that we've seen over recent months means that the government and this parliament is right to act. We've got to get it right. We've got to do it practically, sensitively and compassionately to protect people and other animals. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. It's a pleasure to speak, um, serve under your chairmanship and speak in this emotive and hotly contested debate. I also want to congratulate... Um, my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for his opening speech and introducing this debate. And I must say, I was appalled to actually hear about um, Emma, a courageous mother, the, the mother of uh, a 10 year old Jack who was, um, who was very sadly killed, and the fact that she's been issued with death threats, which I think is completely appalling um, in, in this, this, this debate. So I was very saddened to hear that, and I just want to just pay tribute to her courage for making a contribution to this debate after suffering such a horrendous um, loss. But like the, my right honourable friend, the member for New Forest East, I feel it's my duty to speak on behalf of a number of constituents who have emailed me about this, law-abiding constituents, people who would never dream of thinking that they would become criminals or uh, be on the other side of the law. And I just think these are important voices to be heard. Now, if I may, I just want to just talk about some of the emails um, that I've received from, from these individuals. Um, individuals like uh, Marie Angel, who emails me saying she owns two dogs, a father and a son, two American bulldogs, and had them both, um, for, uh, had them both since birth. One is seven, one is three. And they're not just pets. They, they're members of the family, and they tr she truly loves them both. And they've been good animals, and even her little boy has, um, has grown up with these animals. They both provide emotional support to this family. Her parents and her have suffered from mental health issues in the past and have actually both been homeless in, in, on different occasions. But over the years, the dogs were the only thing that got them through these hard times. And after having finally secured permanent accommodation and, and settling down and making a family, this ban, this news of this potential ban, has had a devastating impact on the mental health of Marie and her family, who she, she can't sleep, she can't eat, keeps breaking down, and she's so scared about what might happen to her beloved animals. So these, these are important voices that I think are sometimes being missed in this debate. The fact that these dogs are not just 
um, are not just animals, they're actually members of the family, and to lose them is heartbroken. Another constituent of mine called Rummy um, talks to me about the special creature that has transformed his life. Uh, this is not just a dog, it's the child of his family and a source of endless joy and unconditional love. An incredible companion that understands her, his joys and sorrows and is always there to provide, provide comfort when needed. It's, again, um, Dame Caroline, this, this is an emotional email that I've received and I feel it's part of my duty to actually speak on behalf of these law-abiding people who can't fathom the idea that they're about to become criminals or could possibly become criminals. And again, been experiencing immense distress and depression as a result of this and has asked me to raise um, their case in this debate today. Another uh, constituent of mine called uh, Dimitrov talked about the loss and despair that he had received over the past months and he's only left with a very, very, without a family and he's, he's here on his own. His mother departed, um, died 16 months ago um, and his father joined shortly thereafter and is suffering from immense grief and loneliness. And the only thing that he feels has got him through this difficult time is his dog. And that friendship, unconditional love that he's had with this dog and the prospect of losing that animal is, is, is just immensely overpowering. Um, a, another constituent of mine called Kathy Beebe, who's a grandmother of six and a law-abiding citizen, a homeowner, someone who's worked all her, all her life, and can't possibly countenance the fact that she, she could become a criminal for owning two American bullets. And feel like she feels like she's been treated like a criminal just for her choice of dogs. And these dogs are not just the life of, of her, but the life of people in their family. And as I said, cannot, uh, cannot countenance the fact that uh, she could be possibly made a criminal. This has been incredibly tough, she's saying to me in her email, to come to terms with, and her mental health is suffering. And as finally, someone who's um, led the campaign in Peterborough, a woman called Laura Creed, um, again, a, a very, very decent, upstanding member of the community, um, someone who I know hasn't got a bad bone in her body, but again, is made, made to feel like she could possibly become a criminal. She's had her girl, her dog, lady, for over 15 years she's owned this dog. Um, she was rescued, this was a rescued dog as well. She suffered abuse, this dog, and been kicked, been abused. But this dog has got a gentle nature and could not possibly think about losing it. We don't know how long they've got left of, of this dog. And she's not an XL bully, by the way, but she may fall under the characteristics of the legislation. Um, and the idea that she could possibly lose this dog is just, um, is just heartbreaking to her. And she asks at the end that there must be a, another way. And that's, that's what I wanted to raise in, in this debate, because these are important voices. These people, in my mind, these law-abiding dog owners, these responsible dog owners, do not present a danger to the public. And there's got to be another way than making, effectively, either giving people the choice of, of losing these dogs or, or further restrictions on the ownership of these dogs, or making them criminals. And for me, I think there are good intentions, obviously, behind behind what's being proposed. No one can sit there and not think and see some of the tragic occurrences that we've heard and deaths that, that we've seen and not feel that they wish to act. But these are good intentions, but are we passing bad legislation as a result of, of these good intentions? So that's all I really wanted to say in this debate today. <coughs> and just urge the Minister, just think and listen to these voices of law-abiding citizens, people who've never been in trouble with the law at any point in their life. Are we not doing something here that we'll look back on in a few years and regret. Thank you very much uh, indeed, David Caroline. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I congratulate the honourable, uh, my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for so ably leading today's petitions committee debate. Uh, 192 of my constituents in South and West have signed the first e-petition, uh, uh, 876, and a further 693 uh, have signed the e-petition ending 611. But it is that first petition that I particularly want to speak about uh, today, and in particular, the need for early intervention to, re to prevent dog bites and other dog-related issues. And the Minister won't be surprised to hear that I'm going to focus on dog-on-dog -dog attacks. Um, because recent estimates, we now know, show that there are some 13 million 
dogs in the UK. You know, we are, we are literally a nation now of dog lovers, with nearly uh, half of all, of all households owning a dog. And we all know that dogs are not just pets. They are much-loved members of the family. Um, they are true companions. And that is, was very much the case uh, in respect of a much-loved Bichon Frise called Millie, who was the constant companion of one of my constituents, Michael. And the minister knows that Millie was viciously attacked uh, in uh, Chalkwell Park in uh, South End on Sea, and, uh, and uh, it was a, as a result of that vicious dog-on-dog -dog attack um, that I really wish uh, to speak today. Uh, because most dog owners are responsible, but there must be consequences for the small minority who are not. Uh, and it's clear to me that it is not the dogs per se that are normally the problem, although there may well be um, a, a, uh, a need, a legitimate need, to single out the XL bully dog. But most dogs are not per se the problem. Dogs have owners, and every dog owner has a responsibility to ensure that their dog does not fatally attack another dog, and certainly a responsibility to make sure their dog does not uh, attack a human being, uh, 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 let alone fatally attack a human being. Yet there is a growing cohort now of evidence that if we tackle dog-on-dog -dog aggression and dog-on-dog -dog attacks in particular, mean we may well prevent dogs from going on and attacking other animals, adults, or even children. Now, laws, both civil and criminal, have been strengthened in recent years to protect the public where a dog presents uh, as a risk to public safety, whether in a public or in a private place. But it remains the case under Section 3.1 of the Dangerous Dogs Act that a dog owner is not liable to any form of criminal prosecution per se when their dog fatally attacks or seriously injures another dog, unless the dog is a guide assistance or service dog, unless the dog in the course of that attack bites a human, or, and I quote, there are grounds for reasonable apprehension that it, i.e. the dog, will injure any person. That is not always the case. And it certainly is not always the case where a larger dog, such as a boxer-style dog or an XL bully dog, makes a beeline for a much smaller dog, which is exactly what happened in the case of my constituent. Now, in the previous session, I had the privilege of bringing forward a 10-minute rule bill that would have required a person in charge of a dog to take all reasonable steps to ensure that their dog does not fatally injure another dog. In other words, early intervention. Um, it was called Emily's Law. Sadly, Emily's Law fell when the house parode. However, this loophole still needs to be plugged. And I've been inundated by emails from people all over the country uh, with concerns about dangerous dogs attacking their dogs. And I would urge the government to initiate an immediate review of existing laws regarding dog attacks with a view to amending the current law to afford pet dogs the same protections that already exist under the law for service uh, guide and therapy dogs. Now, in um, preparation for my 10-minute rule bill, I submitted freedom of information requests to all 43 police forces in the UK, asking if they record dog-on-dog -dog attacks as a separate offence, and if so, how many they had recorded over the last five years. First of all, I was shocked that only 14 police forces actually record dog-on-dog -dog attacks as a separate incident, but of that, those 14, the number of dog-on-dog -dog attacks has increased exponentially. In 2016, those 14 police forces recorded, reported and recorded 1,700 dog-on-dog -dog attacks. In 2021, so five years later, those same 14 police forces recorded 11,559 dog-on-dog -dog attacks, a 700% increase with a shocking 2,264 attacks in London alone. Now, of course, I intend to resubmit those freedom of information uh, requests because I suspect with all the media coverage uh, of incidents like this that they will have increased still further. 
but I do urge the government to take notice of some of these terrible stories, in particular that of Millie and Michael in my constituency, because of the long-standing mental health issues that these attacks, uh, that these attacks cause. Even though it was now uh, nearly two years ago that Millie was savagely attacked by an off-the-lead, out-of-control dog whilst on a walk, whilst on a walk on the lead in a rose garden in Chalkwell Park, Michael is still deeply affected by this. He still comes to see me. He's very upset that, his, that Emily's law has fallen. And this is not atypical. These, these attacks where people irresponsibly allow their dogs to become dangerous and attack other people's dogs have a lasting impact. And it's the responsibility of those owners to take, uh, to take necessary steps to make sure that, these, uh, that we do not have these horrendous, unnecessary attacks. Michael had to carry Millie, who was pretty much torn apart in front of his eyes, uh, bleeding and with serious open wounds to her abdomen, to the nearest vet, to be euthanized. And there's no recourse um, whatsoever, because he did not feel at risk. It was obvious the dog was going for Millie. He did not feel uh, under any reasonable apprehension. It, it, it's worded as an objective test, but it's interpreted by police forces as a subjective test. And that, that is the, the essence of the problem. Part of my bill would have required all police forces to record incidents where a dog has attacked another dog. And this remains hugely important because until we have the full picture in order to assess the true impact of dog-on-dog -dog attacks, we can't make that next step of predicting whether, in fact, it is the first step to going on to attacking a human or a child or another pet. Now, Protect Our Pets, which is a large Facebook campaign group, advise me that dog-on-dog -dog attacks nearly, are nearly always the precursor to an attack on a human uh, or another pet. So reporting in this area will allow for early intervention and hopefully allow us to, pre to prevent some of these awful fatal attacks. So I would urge the government once again to look closely at the provisions of Emily's Law and to work with me to make sure we have all the necessary measures in place to prevent dog-on-dog -dog attacks so that people like Michael do not have to suffer the unnecessary loss of their beloved pets. Mr Gray, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and to participate in this excellent debate. And what concerns me is that 600,000 plus people have signed the main petition which we're debating today the government on the 31st of October uh, laid a statutory instrument under the negative procedure and unless the government agrees to a debate under that negative procedure, this will be the last opportunity for members of this House to express an opinion on this very sensitive subject and to try and help prompt the government into holding a debate. I have today um, laid a tabled an early day motion praying against this statutory instrument uh, and asked that an humble address be addressed to His Majesty praying that the dangerous dogs designated types England and Wales order 2023 SI 2023 number 1164 dated 31st October 2023 a copy of which was laid before this house on 31st October 2023 be annulled. And I do hope that in responding to this debate, my right honourable friend, the Minister, will agree uh, to, um, if he doesn't agree to withdraw those regulations uh, and to think again in the light of, of this debate, he will allow a debate on that very sensitive uh, statutory instrument because uh, we are a, a law-making body and at the moment we've got a statutory instrument which has been laid which will come into force automatically and the drafting of which uh, leaves much to be desired not least because it doesn't have any clear, uh, precise definition of what an XL a bully dog is. And the requirements of, under the 1991 uh, legislation are that there should be a, such a definition in any subsidiary uh, legislation. But Mr Gray, this debate, whole debate, takes me back to 
1991 and the circumstances in which the dangerous dogs legislation was introduced. I was a junior minister in the government at that time and uh, I had, I owned a Rottweiler and that Rottweiler used to frequently come into the precincts of the Palace of Westminster in the days, Mr. Gray, when there was no ban on dogs of whatever breed uh, coming into uh, the palace. And my uh, wife, um, who uh, worked for me then and continues to uh, work for me, uh, she and I uh, used to look after this uh, Rottweiler within the precincts of the, uh, this, this house uh, when we were here uh, working. And in 1991, uh, Dame, the late Dame Angela Rumbold uh, was charged as the Home Office Minister to um, make an urgent uh, reaction to a public concern being expressed about uh, attacks, largely by, actually, by Rottweilers, uh, on uh, children being reported in the press. And it became apparent that what was happening was that there a distorted picture of the pattern of dog attacks and the, the dog breeds responsible for those attacks was emerging because if there was a, one of the 22,000 incidents I think there are every year of, of uh, dogs biting humans, if the dog concern was a particular breed which is under the focus at that time, uh, then that resulted in a report in the newspapers, but not otherwise. And uh, as a result of um, pressure put on the, the, the minister from within government by, by me and by the only other member of the House at that time who had a Rottweiler uh, was uh, the late uh, Alan Clark. Uh, and uh, both, he was a minister at the time and we were both able to persuade uh, Dame Angela uh, that um, as she could see from our Rottweilers that these were not an inherently dangerous uh, dogs that should be uh, banned and whose owners uh, should be if effectively uh, criminalised if they did uh, take, take action. So I, I remind the House of, of that. And then what happened? In, in the context of the debate about it, um, Alistair Campbell, when he was running the Daily Mirror, he thought it would make a very good story to try and, because he found out that I'd got a, a Rottweiler, to make a good story of um, me with my Rottweiler going out and walking on Southampton Common and thereby endangering uh, everybody who else was on that, that common. And uh, he, he, he paid for some, one of his junior staff to camp outside my house in Southampton, as a, then representing Southampton Itchin, in order to try and see uh, me going out of the house or somebody else from the household going out onto Southampton Common with our rock violence so that they, he could take a picture of it. Having failed to, to do that because we were you know, alert to this risk, it didn't stop him uh, putting an article in the, the Daily Mirror uh, referring to me and describing it as a minister's devil dog with a picture of our, our dear uh, Rotty. And that's, that, that was the emotion at the time and it was being played up uh, by uh, the, uh, Her Majesty's then official uh, opposition. A and uh, I, I think that contributed to the government rushing into uh, what was uh, emergency, essentially emergency legislation. And I fear uh, that uh, with the announcement by the Prime Minister and the f announcements which have followed, that the current government is similarly uh, being pushed into doing something perhaps against its uh, better judgment in a rush without thinking it through uh, properly. And particularly, if you're going to ban a particular type of dog or a breed of, a breed of dog, then you've got to have a, a good, good uh, a robust definition. You can't leave it to uh, individual owners to decide for themselves um, what, wh whether or not their dog complies uh, with the, the new uh, definitions. And my right honourable friend, the chairman of the select committee, uh, said uh, it, that there are p people whose X XL uh, bullies are there, they, they, their parents were registered as XL bullies and so on. Uh, and that's, that's fine, but what we are f discussing today is a situation where a lot of dogs which were never bought or uh, as, as XL bullies, would never been described officially as XL bullies, may well be caught by this legislation because it is 
uh, so vaguely uh, drafted. And to have um, guidance uh, then uh, which says that um, you, if, if you think that you may be in this category, then you should um, self-police uh, and that you should uh, report yourself for, for, um, to the authorities because you, you think you may have a, what's described as, as, as an Excel bully type. This is just not the way in which we should be uh, legislating in, in, this, in this House. And there's also, I, I fear this debate is undermined by the lack of uh, data. Uh, the, there's no data, hard data, on how many dog bites resulting in either fatalities or serious injury have emanated in this country from different breeds of dog. So I used that great resource, the internet, um, and came across a website which deals, gives us these the statistics for what's happened in America. And it's called askadamskutner.com. Uh, and, and the most recent dog bite statistics by breed that were responsible for a dog bite, dog bite related fatality, include the following. Pit bulls, 284 deaths. Rottweilers, 45 deaths. German shepherds, 20 deaths. Mixed breeds, 17 deaths. American bully dogs, 15 deaths. Mastiffs, 14 deaths and Siberian Huskies 13 deaths, and it goes on down that. But then, after, uh, after that report, it then says that the, the, the major finding uh, that he, he believes is that irresponsible ownership is responsible for most of these uh, dog uh, bite-related fatalities. I give way to my right honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. We do have statistics from the UK of the last 23 deaths uh, we've had 12 of those were by American Excels. And indeed, you know, not all other breeds are not blamed. In fact, on August the 8th, a 77-year-old gentleman, Mr. Vic Franklin, was bitten by two Rottweilers and had to have his arm, leg, and part of his finger amputated following that attack. So, you know, there are other breeds, but they don't feature disproportionately in the statistics. It's true. Well, but the, Mr. Gray, the, 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 the problem is the, the statistics are of, of a moment. Yeah. What has happened, my right honourable friend is saying, well, these, these are the statistics that are just over, the, over uh, recent months. Uh, but um, if, you, if one looks back since 1991, one might be able to show that a number, there have been a number of Rottweiler uh, attacks and the Rottweilers were exempt from that dangerous dogs legislation in the circumstances uh, I've described. And what we've now got is a situation where we're picking on a particular breed and not even a precise definition of uh, that breed, instead of doing what all informed opinion has been asking for, which is basically to go back and look at the legislation itself and to legislate against those who have dogs of whatever breed uh, and allow them to get out of control and, and attack um, other dogs or, or um, humans. And I think it's, it's telling that about a year ago, the, in response to a petition uh, asking for the government to review the dangerous dogs legislation, the government set up a review into uh, this because it recognised that there might be a problem uh, with the current legislation. And then as soon as there were a few headlines around XL bullies, um, in a knee-jerk reaction, I think it was a knee-jerk reaction, the Prime Minister decided, must take action about this, and so I must announce a ban. And that ban comes into effect on the 31st of December, uh, with the legislation, as I've described, laid, and no opportunity whatsoever uh, for the government or for parliament to be able to consider again the detail of that uh, legislation. My uh, honourable friend from Penrith and the Border said, well, we, we need to have a, continue to look at these issues. Uh, and uh, there's an iterative process associated with it. There's no iterative process now. The, the, the statutory instrument has been laid and it is in law, and it will come into law on the 31st of December, unless or until this House forces the government uh, to bring forward a, a motion, um, and we can then vote it down, uh, or unless the, the government itself decides to uh, withdraw that um, statutory instrument and, and think uh, again. So this, we are talking about uh, desperate measures imposed um, in an autocratic uh, style in, in a, over a short space of time with consequences 
for our constituents up and down the country, uh, which are uh, very challenging. And, and members across both sides of the House have referred to individual uh, constituents who've written to them. I've, I've had a number of constituents who've written to me uh, very persuasive uh, and emotional uh, letters and, and, and emails explaining why they don't think that their particular dog uh, should um, have to be uh, changed, uh, muzzled, uh, or ultimately even euthanized as a result of this legislation, they, which they think is totally uh, disproportionate. And, and I'm just going to refer to one particular um, uh, person who's, who's written to me uh, because uh, that person is the owner of a a mastiff cross, but which he believes, and his wife as well, believe will satisfy uh, or may satisfy the definition of an XL bully as contained in the guidance which has been issued uh, by the uh, government. And why should somebody who's got, I referred earlier to mastiffs, um, why should somebody with a mastiff cross um, breed be find that that a breed is de that that particular dog is defined as as an XL bully type when it's when it's not an XL bully type it just happens to be a a, a large uh, and thick set uh, a dog and the consequence for um, him and his family because they they. Uh, took this dog from a rescue place about uh, five years ago following um, a, a personal family uh, disaster, and that dog has been uh, their way out of a really difficult, mental, mentally stressing situation. And now to find that that dog is no longer going to be able to have the freedom of walking uh, through, as they, they say here, uh, take it, going through the, 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 the new forest uh, and going on the beaches and going in the hills, um, Dartmoor and so on, uh, on as, a, as a normal dog would, uh, then uh, I, I, you, one can see from this, this letter how upset that person is. And this is a dog... Um, so that the person to whom I know, uh, referring will know, his dog is called Ronnie. And Ronnie is not an XL bully, but could be classed as an XL bully under this vague uh, and imprecise uh, legislation. I must say that my, my one-year-old daughter, who was um, alive, born in 1990, and she lived with our Rottweiler... Uh, in, 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 at the time of the dangerous dogs legislation, that was another factor, I think, which um, Angela Rumbold took into account, because here was a, here was a Rottweiler, a so-called dangerous dog, actually living in the same household as uh, one of uh, Her Majesty's uh, uh, ministers and living a, a perfectly quiet existence. I don't know whether it was because of the uh, legislation or whatever, but it re resulted in my daughter ultimately becoming a, a member of the esteemed veterinary profession. Uh, and so she is now part of that cohort of experts who are saying this is not the right way forward. The what they have said in response uh, to the legislation brought forward by, by the government is that this is a uh, completely the wrong way uh, to go about it. Uh, and why isn't the government listening? Uh, this is, um, dare one say it, Mr Gray, the arrogance that comes from having too large a majority, perhaps, or, or the, uh, the deference to the Prime Minister on the basis that the Prime Minister has decreed on the basis of little evidence at the time, but in, in scramble to try and get the evidence together, uh, the Ministers feel that they have to deliver on the Prime Minister's uh, will rather than actually stand up to him and say, hang on a minute, I think um, your knee-jerk reaction was the, the wrong one. Because all the people, including the, the, the vets, uh, who are concerned about this, are in, in something called the Dog Control Coalition. And it's made up of the RSPCA, Blue Cross, Battersea Dogs Home, Dogs Trust, Hope Rescue, the Scottish SPCA, the Royal Kennel Club, and the British Veterinary uh, Association. And what they say is, is the Dog Control Coalition agrees that urgent action needs to be taken to protect the public from out-of-control dogs, not specific breeds. But we are disappointed that the government hasn't taken the opportunity to completely overhaul the Dangerous Dogs Act. 
with its continued focus on specific breeds rather than a focus on prevention and implementation of tougher penalties for those owners not in control of their dogs, it is not fit for purpose. All those organisations to which I've referred say that this legislation is not fit for purpose. And yet the government isn't, uh, on the present, unless we hear from something to the contrary from the minister, is not even going to allow the House to have a vote on this legislation so that members across the House can be held to account uh, by uh, their own constituents and can express uh, their own view on whether they think this is good legislation or not. And even if the intention of the legislation is good, surely we should be looking at the detail uh, because we're talking about potentially new criminal penalties affecting uh, people's uh, freedom. And do we, do we want to criminalise um, behaviour in people owning or ha handling dogs of a description which is so vague that uh, they won't be certain in advance as to whether or not they will be offending against the law by not registering uh, their, their dog as being a, 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 an XL bully t type of of dog. So, uh, Mr. Gray, this is, um, in, in my view, um, one of the uh, worst pieces of legislation brought forward by this government, and um, that's quite a high bar to get over, actually, um, in, 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 in my view, in, in having looked at the, the, ter the terms of what's happened during, since the 2019 uh, general election. I must say, I thought um, uh, by my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, introduce this debate um, in such a mild, rational way uh, that we, he was going to probably be able to single-handedly persuade the government uh, to, to think again. And my style is slightly different, perhaps, from his, from his uh, but I hope that between us uh, we will be able uh, to persuade the government, and I suppose ultimately, because nothing can be changed unless the Prime Minister gives it his say-so, um, ultimately persuade uh, the, the government uh, to, uh, and the Prime Minister to uh, change its view on, on this. And listen to the voices uh, of 600,000 plus people who've signed these petitions. Mr Gray, you know and I know how difficult it is to get people to sign petitions. Um, and to get 600,000 signatures is no mean feat. And I think that uh, we uh, will ignore that mass of opinion uh, at our peril, unless we are able to show that we have done everything possible to examine alternative ways of dealing uh, with this uh, problem, introducing uh, proper uh, safeguards in terms of, of definitions, and, and ultimately uh, recognising the plea that there has been ever since the 1991 legislation uh, that uh, we shouldn't legislate in haste and that we should actually now deal with the underlying problem, which is just as bad as it's ever been, which is that there are a large number of dog owners who are, or a, a, a relatively small proportion of the total, but a, a significant number of dog owners who are themselves irresponsible. And some people talk about having a licensing system for dogs. Perhaps we should have a licensing system, Mr Gray, for dog owners. Mm -hmm. And in the same way as we have a licensing system for car drivers. Why not a licensing system for, for, for dog owners? I, I put that forward as a, as a proposition. Um, I don't normally uh, campaign in favour of uh, more legislation and, and regulation, but as an alternative to the rotten le legislation that we've got here, I, I put that forward as a, as a reasonable alternative. Mr. Gray, it's a pleasure to see you in the chair this afternoon and I begin by thanking all those people who added their names to petitions 624, 876 and 643611 and of course to my honourable friend for Don Valley for leading the debate in the manner he has done for us today. We have heard some passionate and emotive contributions from across the House and those present will know that this has been a matter that has caused genuine concern across all quarters of civic society. There is strong feelings on all sides. Those who think breeds should be banned, those who do not, animal lovers, academics, animal charities, welfare groups and many more stakeholders have all had their say on the subject of the proposed ban. The proposal of the ban, of course, coming in the wake of what has been an undeniable spate of attacks on other animals and people. And we all, of course, share the horror of any dog attack, of course, especially with higher reported cases of XL bully-related 
incidents. And some of those reports, as we have heard today, have been truly horrific and have resulted in fatalities. And as the Chair of the Select Committee outlined, those of us who are on the EFRA Committee of this place have heard hours of oral evidence. We have read hundreds of pages as well, and as well as many constituent inquiries. It is apparent that the rush nature of this ban has only exacerbated public concern. The Dangerous Dog Dogs Act is, in the view of many, a flawed piece of legislation, and adding the XL bully to it in this fashion, rushed through in this way, causes concern for many stakeholders and interested parties. The Scottish Government has fully and carefully considered the UK Government's decision to ban the XL bully dogs and whether similar changes to the ban of the breed will be applied in Scotland. Now, having listened to the advice being given by its advisers, the experts in the field, of course, it has been made clear by the Scottish Government Minister in a recent letter to Lord Benyon that the ban will not be brought into force in Scotland on the current timescales the UK Government is implementing. The Scottish Government keeps all dog control legislation under constant and consistent review, and that includes the ban breeds list, and will continue to do so going forward. The focus in Scotland for some considerable time has been on dog control policy and supported by the Scottish SPCA. The view is that responsible dog ownership, whatever the breed of dog may be, is the key to safer communities. However, if the long-standing list of banned breeds can have a role to play in keeping communities safe, then the Scottish Government will, of course, consider that, using the evidence of what may work without any unintended consequences, and it is those unintended consequences, such as mistyping a dog, that could see innocent, well-trained, well-looked-after and much-loved family pets caught up in this as this legislation is rushed through this place. The defining of exactly what breed type should be covered by a ban is the key challenge with the UK Government is facing, and they have, of course, set up an expert group on this very subject. And that, too, will help inform decision-making in Scotland, and any departure from the current position will be fully considered. And again, those of us who sit on the EFRA Committee of this House will have heard all about the implica implications of attempting to type a dog and how difficult that actually is, even for experts. And my honourable friend from Wandsbeck also raised many valid concerns about typing uh, of dogs. And it, it reminded me of the time when I was a young boy, I read uh, the book of the English uh, rugby player, Lawrence Delalio. His, his family pet was a, a Ridgeback, a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and hit, attacked uh, his eight-year-old son away back in two, 2008. So again, these are the types of dogs that you, they are big, they, are, um, they have uh, excessive weights, and if these dogs lock on, um, they, they will face the same consequences as what an XL bully uh, type dog does as well. So we have concerns about just targeting the specific breed. Of course I will. Well, is he not concerned that this sort of attack also happens in Scotland? In fact, last month in Motherwell, uh, uh, an 18-year-old owner of one of these XL bullies was, was attacked savagely and needed surgery, and two council officials uh, were actually attacked also, and pepper spray needed to be used on the dog before it was put down. Well, uh, member for his intervention. Of course, I share the concerns. I don't think anybody in this chamber, indeed across the whole house, does not share the concerns uh, of irresponsible dog ownership and the fatalities or the, the actions that can be carried out um, uh, when somebody is not acting uh, responsibly. Of course, we share uh, the concerns. Motherwell is my local town, by the way. So, deeply concerned about uh, that. But again, the Scottish Government has considered carefully the evidence-based suggestions from experts to help improve community safety, including keeping the prohibited uh, breed list under, as I say, constant review. And we will continue to engage with all stakeholders on the concept of a ban and how it might be implemented here uh, in England and Wales. The Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010 was designed to highlight the responsibilities of dog owners by putting in place a regime, a regime that identifies out-of-control dogs at an early juncture 
and provides measures to change the behaviour of these dogs and their owners before they become deemed as dangerous. The UK Government should perhaps look to follow this approach as by taken by the Scottish Government. And we in Scotland have also introduced a national dog control database which is helping independent enforcement agencies like our local authorities and Police Scotland to access information on dog owners who allow their dogs to be out of control in a public Place. The Scottish Government also carried out a marketing campaign on dog control in conjunction with the Scottish SPCA in 2021. This campaign has since been rerun on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and all other available outlets on a number of occasions and it directs the public to information about the law on controlling your dog and that is available via the MyScotGov website at controllingyourdogpublic.scot. This website makes clear that dog owners are responsible for the actions of their dog and sets out potential penalties for those failing to control dogs. These actions are not reactions to a spate of dog attacks, as my honourable friend outlined about dog attacks um, from um, Dobermans or uh, Rottweilers uh, uh, way back as 1991. The Dangerous Dogs Act then uh, was rush, uh, rush legislation uh, in relation to a spate of dog attacks, and that's what we're seeing uh, coming from the UK government uh, again. These are uh, not, that's not consistent. And uh, while these in Scotland is not reacting to a spate of uh, dog attacks, it's a, con a consistent and a continuous body of work that has been and continues to be undertaken in Scotland that can not only help to react to trends, but can also actively prevent them. Chair, I think that due to the government bringing forward this ban and in the manner it has done, uh, again with any prior conversation or consultation with the devolved government, is regretful and it is also uh, important to emphasise to those concerned that a dog being classed as a banned breed will not automatically mean that that animal will be put down. If conditions are met, such as having a dog neutered or spayed and keeping that dog muzzled in public, a dog could be placed on the new index of exempted dogs. More generally, it is important to put on record just how much we in the SNP value the work of Police Scotland, Scottish local authorities, the SSPCA, who all work closely with the Scottish Government to help keep our communities safe from the small minority of irresponsible dog owners and their dangerous dogs. The Scottish Government will, of course, continue to work closely with the United Kingdom Government on their intentions of the proposal of a ban for the XL breed, whilst continuing to lead on several regional engagements to look at ways for partners to work together collaboratively to improve the operational response, the enforcement and the community engagement to help promote more responsible dog ownership across our communities. And here at Westminster, we and the SNP will continue to call on the UK Government to return the Kept Animals Bill to Parliament to restrict unethical puppy farming and imports from abroad, abroad and to improve our welfare standards for all animals. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak into the, this debate and respond on behalf of the opposition. As you can see and as you can probably hear, I am not the member for Newport West. I do not have the same beautiful Welsh accent. Um, my department colleague is in the chamber due to a clash of business. As such, I am speaking for the opposition this afternoon. But my honourable friend sends her good wishes to one and all here, and I know she will be reading Hansard tomorrow. And I'd like to begin by thanking the honourable member for Don Valley for opening the debate on these two important petitions, and may I say, for setting a really considered and careful tone, which has been continued throughout the debate. So congratulations for that. And I'd also like to acknowledge all those colleagues who have spoken in the debate today, uh, particularly my honourable friend for Wandsbeck, who I always enjoy the contributions uh, from, who recognised how emotive this issue was and how much these pets mean to so many people and that views are different but we can't just base 
any kind of ban on what a dog looks like. And that point has certainly been echoed throughout the debate uh, here today. And my honourable friend for uh, Neef, who was shared her upset over the attacks, which I'm sure we, we all echo, and her concerns with the current legislation not working. And again, these problems around how do we define this if the definition is too woolly were important points. And if I may, I'd like to mention some of the... Um, comments made by the government, uh, government party, which I really enjoyed. I did enjoy the right honourable member for Christchurch in Dorset's point that the government with too large a majority may appear overly arrogant. So I promise we're doing everything we can to deal with that over, over on this side, one by, election, one by election at a time. But more seriously, the point he made about the imprecision, again, around legislation, I, I think is, is an important one. And also, uh, if I may, um, the Honourable Member for Penrith and the Border's expertise as a vet, I think, has really contributed to the debate today. And it's the first time I've heard of ear cropping, and I share his horror at hearing about that and, and that awful, uh, awful practice that's been done. And, and may I also pay tribute to the right Honourable Member for Suffolk Coastal, who, despite our various disagreements, to actually have faced death threats over her stance on this issue and still come here to defend the legislation that she brought forward I think should be commended so I commend you for I commend you for doing that and I utterly am appalled by any member of parliament anybody facing death threats for standing up for what they believe there might be differences of opinion but surely we are here to debate them all in a calm and, and considered manner, which of course always comes from the member for New Forest East, who also mentioned his, uh, his points around problems of definition. So thank you, everyone. But also, very importantly, acknowledge and thank all those people up and down the country who signed this petition. And when I first started drafting these remarks, more than 600,000 had signed a uh, petition at number 624876, and more than uh, 100,000 had signed the alternative one as well. And I will also um, pay tribute to the person who started the petition. It is very important that these issues are brought to debate. And I think shows how the petition system is working effectively for our democracy, that people can use a petition to share their views, that we bring it here and we debate it, I think is a healthy thing. And I commend every single person who signed it. So it's important that we take the time to acknowledge the issues that our constituents really care about. And I know, I'd, I'd also like to note, there are a number of colleagues from across the House who have a keen interest on this issue and have campaigned and worked on this for many, many years. And I'd like to give special mention to my honourable friend from Carrafilly, who has been a Dowerty and Lau campaigner, and I know the member for Newport West is very grateful for his advice, experience and work. My honourable friend, the Shadow Animal Welfare Minister, has said that it that is in this chamber before this side of the house believes in honouring our commitment to animal welfare and we will always push for the strongest possible animal welfare policies. We are, as been mentioned, a nation of animal lovers and pets are, of course, part of all of our families. But this also means that ensuring that dogs are not left or encouraged to become a danger to themselves, that owners of other animals are other people. And it means, as has been mentioned, owners are responsible and that they care and they treat their dogs in a humane and respectful way. Like many on this side of the house, I've been deeply concerned by the recent rise in dog-on-human attacks in recent weeks and months. It's clear that action is needed to improve the Dangerous Dogs Act, and for that action to be taken sooner rather than later. This is a point, again, that's come up many times in this debate. Not to look at this in isolation, but look at it as part of a wider piece looking at this uh, legislation. Because piecemeal legislation can result in unintended consequences. It is obvious to us all that dog attacks have increased in number in the 32 years since the Dangerous Dog Act came into force. Unfortunately, when we talk about the threats posed by dangerous dogs, the facts speak for themselves. From January to July 2020, 7,790 dog attacks occurred across the UK. Just two years later, for the same period, there were 9,834 attacks, which represents a 26% increase. The number of deaths caused by dogs is also very bleak. Since 2013, there have been more than five deaths per year. And yet last year, 10 people lost their lives. And I acknowledge the presence today of those who have lost loved ones and who desperately need common sense to win the day. 
And I thank again the Honourable Member for Don Valley for mentioning uh, Emma and the death threats and the abuse that she's faced. And I agree with him that it's utterly appalling and she's been through enough. There are a number of reasons why dog attacks have increased recently, and it's also the case that dog ownership increased markedly during the COVID pandemic. The People's Dispensary for Sick Animals has stated that from February 2021 to February 2020, dog ownership figures increased significantly, so that 27%, this amazed me when I looked this up, 27% of, adult, of UK adults owned a dog, and that the UK's dog population stood at 10.2 million, which is amazing. Back in 2018, which is just a short period after my election to this place, the uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee launched a report which called for a full-scale review of current dog control legislation and policy to ensure the public is properly protected and animal welfare concerns are effectively addressed. More specifically, <clears throat> the report made 16 recommendations to the government, the most important of which can be summarised as follows, which I will quote, there was a call for the end of the prohibition on transferring a banned dog if it had been assessed and found to be safe. It called for a commission to be established to ascertain whether the four banned breeds presented a greater risk than any legal breed or crossbreed. It called for a review of current legislation and policy relating to dogs and the development of alternative model focusing on what it called prevention through education, early intervention and consistently robust sanctions for offenders. So I'd be grateful if the Minister could give us a progress check on the response to that report and if he can provide an update. It would be also helpful to know what discussions the Minister has had with the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales about their approach to this issue. Because as has been mentioned, this legislation only covers England and Wales. So it's clear that a joined approach is going to be required to the handling of this issue and more specifically how we respond across the United Kingdom, not just from an enforcement perspective. And I'd like to touch on the first petition on the American XL bully. As colleagues across the House will know, ministers recently announced that they would add the American XL bully to a list of dogs that are banned under the Dangerous Dog Act. There are currently four breeds on this list. The Pitbull Terrier, the Japanese Toaster, the... I'm going to say all these terribly, aren't I? The Dogo Argentino and the Filler Brasilio. We'll, we'll go with that. The current approach to dog control in this country is misguided and does not protect people adequately. On this side of the house, we believe that safety must be our top priority, but without unnecessarily punishing responsible dog owners or harming dogs that are not necessarily a risk. It is a common sense approach that is required, and it is for ministers to make sure they deliver one. I very much agree with the RSPCA, and I pay tribute to them for their work on this and animal welfare more generally, when they said that, quote, in, in light of ser recent serious dog bite incidents, the increased enforcement is necessary to improve human safety and they express deep concern to anyone impacted by these tragic incidents. It is all very good to want to take a very knee-jerk reaction and introduce a speedy ban on a particular breed, but there are wider implications that must be factored in. The Minister will have heard a number of comments regarding uh, rehoming, so I'd be keen to know what discussions he's had with that and what will be done to make sure that dogs won't be put down because they're unable to be rehomed and how can we make sure that a ban will not lead to a very sudden and steep increase in abandonment and stray dogs from owners worried about the cost of meeting these restrictions and as was mentioned at the beginning of the debate how is this being communicated to these current dog owners can the minister also take a moment to address a specific point on definition which has come up a lot the RSPCA and other campaign groups are right to point out that a de definition of XL is very broad indeed. I'm extremely concerned about the number of healthy, much loved dogs that will be unnecessarily swept up in the ban, and the Minister needs to get a grip on this. The Minister will know that rescue and veterinary sectors are both under considerable strain and pressure following the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. There are major concerns about costs and the increased number of animals coming into the sector's care. So what support we provided to vets to make sure they are able to assist and respond to the impact that this ban will have. There is much to do to get this right, from a public safety perspective and from an animal welfare perspective too. So I urge the Minister to reach out, to listen, to engage with campaigners, stakeholders and owners and the valid concerns that have been raised in this debate. So can the Minister set out what meetings he has had with stakeholders and campaigners on this issue Engagement and communication with the dog and animal welfare sector is going to be key to getting this right, and the Minister needs to go further, do more, listen harder. 
Chair, I have already touched on the need for real root and branch unpicking of dog legislation in this country. The year 1991 really does seem a very long time ago now. And it is right to listen, learn, review and improve. And I urge the Minister to do just that. So can he confirm he will look at a full and total review of dog control legislation in this country? And if so, when will it happen? I know that my honourable friend from Newport West will be very happy to have an answer in writing if the Minister doesn't, isn't able to answer this specific question or any of the others I have put to him. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you uh, very much, Mr Gray. It's a pleasure to serve under your uh, chairmanship. I'm uh, uh, responding on behalf of uh, Lord Benyon, who is the Minister uh, responsible who uh, resides in a, another place. But uh, I think what we've seen today is, is the House at its very best debate. I think we've had a very uh, informed debate. I think it's been uh, a series of members who have wrestled with the challenge that the government faces of keeping uh, people safe in our communities, but at the same time making sure we don't affect people's much-loved uh, pets. And that's been a debate which has been uh, informed uh, and enriched, not least of all by the former Secretary of State, the member for Southwark Coastal, who I, I think added a great deal to the debate with her, with her presence, as well as the uh, Chairman of the Select Committee, who's done a lot of work in this area. Uh, I knew when I saw my honourable friend from uh, South and West that I was about to uh, uh, be challenged uh, over dog-on-dog -dog attacks, and she is indeed a tenacious campaigner. I know that her constituent, Michael, will be uh, very pleased to see her in a place representing uh, uh, poor old Millie, who uh, suffered terribly uh, at the hands of a dog-on-dog -dog attack. And uh, I pay tribute to her for the work that she does. But I think we've had a number of great contributions. And, um, uh, you know, what I would say is we should stop and pause, and I think, as the member for Don Valley did at the beginning just to recognise that dog attacks can have horrific consequences. Uh, and this is something that the government takes very seriously indeed. We've sadly seen an increase in serious and fatal dog attacks in recent years. Uh, the XL bully breed uh, type appears to have been disproportionately involved uh, in that rise in attacks. And that's why we've taken decisive action to ban the XL bully breed type and to attempt to keep our communities safe. Uh, from the 1st of February 24, it will be illegal to be in possession of an XL bully breed type unless you have a certificate of exemption. Now, we recognise the strength of feeling on breed-specific legislation and that some people are opposed uh, to the prohibitions placed on specific breed types. However, the government must balance these views with our responsibility to protect public safety. And we remain concerned that lifting any restrictions may result in more dog attacks, and therefore there are no plans to repeal the breed-specific provisions within the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991. Police and local authorities already have a range of powers available to tackle dangerous dogs and irresponsible dog ownership across all breeds of dog. Uh, this can range from... Uh, lower level community protection notices which require dog owners to take appropriate action to address behaviour to more serious offences under the Dangerous Dogs Act where people can be put in prison for up to 14 years, be disqualified from ownership or result in dangerous dogs being euthanised. Now we're working closely with enforcers to make sure that the full force of the law is applied for incidents involving all breeds of dog. And of course... We know that dog attacks are complex and there is no single silver bullet. That's why alongside the ban, uh, we're taking a multi-factorial uh, approach to reducing dog attacks through our Responsible Dog Ownership Task Force. The task force is considering the role of educating and training for both dogs and their owners and how we can improve data collection, recording and enforcement practices. We expect the task force to make its final recommendations very soon. Now, in the meantime, DEFRA officials have been uh, collaborating with the police, with local authorities, to deliver uh, sessions to share best practice in preventing dog control, uh, in preventative, sorry, dog control enforcement and encourage multi-agency working. Uh, we've been coordinating communications. Uh, uh, so we... we uh, 
uh, basically coordinate those communication pushes with key partners so that families are equipped with practical tips to enjoy spending time safely with dogs. Now, this messaging has been widely disseminated to parents, to health visitors, uh, school nurses, safeguarding professionals, police forces, as well as local authorities. More widely, we're actively considering uh, whether action is required to further protect dogs in breeding settings. As part of, of this, we're reviewing the regulations for anyone in the business of breeding and selling dogs, uh, and we have commissioned a report from the Animal Welfare Committee on the welfare implications of specialised canine reproductive uh, practices. Now, I hope colleagues are reassured that the government is taking this issue very seriously, uh, that there is a wide-ranging action uh, is necessary to ensure continued public safety, and I, I look forward to discussing the conclusions of the Responsible Dog Ownership Task Force in, in due course. Uh, Mr Gray, can I put on record my thanks to everyone who's contributed today to the debate. I think uh, it's been an informed uh, debate well, and, uh, and of course I give way to my good friend from Christchurch. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to my right on giving way. Will he facilitate a debate on the statutory instrument because it is obviously of great concern to a lot of members of Parliament and even more so to our constituents before it comes into force on the 31st of December. Thank you for that, for that intervention. He, he, of course, will be fully aware that uh, uh, it is for business managers to arrange uh, such, such debates. But, of course, I will go and have a conversation with those business uh, uh, managers following this debate. But I think the House has been more informed and is more informed following to, uh, this afternoon's uh, debate, and I thank uh, members uh, across the House for their constructive contributions. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, to um, agree with the Minister. It's been a, an extremely well-informed debate, well-attended, and it's obviously been going on for quite, quite some time now. Um, there's obviously still pieces of work that need to do on this, and there's concerns on both sides of this. I would obviously encourage all owners of dogs to be extremely responsible with their, with their pets because I often hear when dogs have bit, the, the first thing that they say is, well, it's never done that before. Well, unfortunately, with some breeds, when it's never done that before, the first time it does do it, it can be fatal. And this is something that we've really, really got to consider. I know there's a huge amount of interest in this, and I know we are a dog-loving nation, but in sitting in front of a parent who has lost a child or to talk to a father whose daughter's got scars on her legs for the rest of her life. That is what we need to try and stop. Now, there's obviously lots of work going around this, and I do, I'm do. i pleased to hear that the, that the department is doing much work on responsible ownership. I did speak to many professionals about this, and they accepted that this ban is going forward, whether they agree with it or not, they didn't accept it was going forward. But they didn't want to be in the same place in five or ten years' time because we've not really gone forward with this responsible uh, ownership. So we do need a database. We do need to enforce um, shipping of dogs. We do need a register of every bite that happens, because I think some of, the, um, some of the concerns about banning the XL bully is that there's no real data on how many dogs, how many bites um, and fatalities have actually been involved with, with this dog. So if we've got a database there, we can turn around to the public in five or ten years' time, if it does happen with another dog, and say, look, we've really got the facts here. So I thank everybody once again. Uh, there will be continued debate going on about this on social media, um, and I just want to reiterate what other people have said about the member from uh, Suffolk Coastal. That should not happen. That really, really should not happen. And everybody who is watching this debate, members in this House are doing this job for the right reason. They want to make this country safe. They want to make this world a better place for us all to live in. And if we take away this arena to debate because members have been threatened, then unfortunately that will be a, well, it will be a travesty. So we really must make sure that we keep all the dialogue respectful. And that includes the petitioners and obviously people, uh, mums and dads of children who have been affected and are obviously on the other side of this argument. So I thank you all once again and uh, I thank you, Chair. I thank the petitions committee as well because they do a huge amount of work. It's an honour to lead these debates. Thank you. The uh, question is that this House is considered e-petitions 624876 and 643611. 
relating to legislation with respect to dangerous dogs. The member of the say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting stands adjourned. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.